Thus far, we have concerned ourselves with one form of heat transfer, radiation. We have learned that solar energy is in the form of electromagnetic waves, and that these waves are classified by wavelength. The wavelengths that reach the top of the Earth's atmosphere are primarily ultraviolet, visible light, and infrared. And collectively, we call this shortwave radiation. Notably, visible light makes up the highest percentage of this shortwave radiation. We've also learned that there are four things that can happen to radiation. Namely, it can be absorbed, reflected, scattered, or transmitted. The atmosphere transmits shortwave radiation, and Earth absorbs it and re-emits longwave radiation, thermal infrared. Notably, it is this emission of infrared radiation that heats up the troposphere. Thus, as you rise further away from the Earth in the troposphere, it gets colder. Additionally, it is this infrared radiation that is trapped by greenhouse gases in the troposphere, warming the troposphere by the greenhouse effect. Over the last several decades, humans have increased the concentration of greenhouse gases in the troposphere, thus resulting in more trapped heat and tropospheric global warming. So most of what we've discussed thus far deals with radiation, but radiation is just one form of heat transfer. There are three methods of heat transfer. Here are the three methods. You should memorize them and be able to define them. Additionally, you will need to be able to use these terms correctly when we describe heat transfer in a home, in the atmosphere, in a car, in a solar cooker, etc. The next few slides will go through these three methods of heat transfer in order, radiation, conduction, and convection. So another quick view on radiation. We know that all objects radiate, and the type and intensity of that radiation depends on the temperature of the object and the material. For instance, the sun is very hot, and thus it tends to emit very short wave radiation. You and I and the Earth are quite cool compared to the Sun, and thus we emit longer wave radiation, thermal infrared. Additionally, we've spent a great deal of time now noting what things, what might happen to that radiation. You'll remember that there are four things that can happen to radiation as it travels through our atmosphere. It can be absorbed, reflected, scattered, or transmitted. All right. Let's move on and discuss conduction. Conduction is heat transfer through molecular collisions. As noted in the definition, heat is transferred as the molecules collide. Higher temperature molecules have more kinetic energy at the atomic level. Remember our definition of temperature. Temperature is the average kinetic energy of the atoms of a substance. So the atoms of the higher temperature object are vi vibrating more vigorously. And when these atoms collide with adjacent molecules that are cooler, they pass along their atomic kinetic energy to the adjacent molecules, and those adjacent molecules heat up. Their temperature increases. So heat passes from hotter objects to cooler objects. You can see in this diagram here, there's a metal poker that's being used in a fire. And as it heats up, the molecules in the metal poker are colliding, and the heat is being conducted up the metal rod, eventually to your hand. Watch out! Importantly, different substances have different abilities to conduct heat. You know this intuitively. Pretend we are sitting around a campfire, and there are two objects sticking out of the fire, a metal rod and a long wooden stick. I ask you to stir the fire. Which object would you use? Hopefully you pick the stick, because you know the metal rod will be hot. Why do some substances conduct heat better? Generally, it has to do with how densely their atoms are packed together. In densely packed structures, like metals, the vibrating atoms will be able to knock into more adjacent atoms, thus transferring their energy. If the atoms are spread farther apart, less collisions will result. Thus, in general, solids conduct heat better than liquids, and liquids conduct heat better than gases. 
It has to do with the density of the molecules in the material. In the example given previously, the wooden stick has a lot of air within its structure. So wood does not conduct heat well because air does not conduct heat well. Similarly, let's consider a few more examples. A wool sweater helps keep you warm because of all that air trapped in the wool limits conductive heat loss from your body. Again, in general, gases, like air, are poor conductors. A pot holder is simply a cloth with lots of air holes in it, thus it limits conduction. Have you noticed that the pot holder doesn't work nearly as well when it's wet, when liquid is filling the holes? Fiberglass insulation used in the walls in your home is a simple method for trapping air and keeping the air from moving. This still air trapped in your, in your walls limits conductive heat losses. Another example in your home, double-paned windows use air and sometimes other gases to better insulate your windows from conductive heat losses. Consider the pausing the video and reviewing the definition of conduction and explaining to yourself why solids conduct heat better than liquids and why liquids conduct heat better than gases, and then also be able to describe some everyday objects on whether they would conduct heat well or not. All right, let's move on to convection. Convection is heat transfer by moving fluids. Importantly, in physics, fluids refer to both liquids and gases. So convection is the heat transfer by moving liquids and moving gases. In physical geography, this means heat transfer by moving water and air currents. Your textbook makes the distinction between convection, vertical air movement, and advection, horizontal air movement. However, for our purposes, we're going to simply lump it all together as one big convection current. Check out the convection cell shown here. Convection cells in general form due to unequal heating, and in this case, the heater on one side of the room heats the air here, which rises, and cooler air moves in to fill the void. Then on the other side of the room, that hot air eventually moves further away from the heater, and it cools, and it cooler air descends, and then eventually gets sucked in over here, and it, you have a whole convection cell or convection current. Indeed, convection cells occur in our homes and even in the walls of our homes, especially if they're not insulated. A clever architect can actually use convection cells to heat and cool homes using only the sun, or with very small heating units and fans. This is called passive solar heating, using these natural convection cells to control temperatures in a home. You can also see convection currents at work when you cook alphabet soup on the stove. Watch those letters move. So again, convection cells occur in the atmosphere and ocean because of the uneven heating of the earth, just like convection currents occurred in this home due to uneven heating from the one little wall heater. In general, warm air rises and cool air descends. But why does hot air rise? Did you figure that out when we were discussing the convection cell shown here? When air or water warms, it expands. Thus it has the same mass, but a larger volume. Its density has decreased. So when air warms and expands, it is less dense than the surrounding air or water, so it rises. As it rises, it creates a low pressure void, because the molecules have been removed, that surrounding gases or liquids flow into. Similarly, in cooler regions, the air or water contracts and becomes more dense, so it descends. Convection currents are very common in natural air systems or natural water systems. Wind and water currents are a form of convection. The primary topic in this video clip is the three methods of heat transfer. But I am going to tack on a couple last few topics here um, just some odds and ends having to do with, with temperature and heating and cooling. Um, the two remaining topics that I'm going to just touch on are adiabatic cooling and warming and latent heat. I'm going to go through them fairly quickly 
as they are not the focus of our material in chapter 4. Rather, I'm just introducing them so that you'll have a bit of understanding when we cover them in more detail later in the course. First, adiabatic cooling and warming. When air rises, it is under less pressure, as there are less molecules at higher elevations. Since the air is under less pressure, it expands. Remember how your water bottle expanded at higher elevation? Moving outward took some work. Essentially, that work done by the molecules moving outward diminishes the average kinetic energy of the atoms in the system, so the temperature decreases. So again, when pressure decreases, air expands and cools. You can see the little weather balloon that they have here as it rises higher in the sky. The balloon actually gets bigger because the air inside it has expanded. And then also, if there was a temperature inside the balloon, the temperature would be lower. When air rises, it expands and cools. You may have experienced something like this firsthand when you've taken the air out of a pressurized tire. The air feels cool as it moves from the high pressure tire to the low pressure surrounding air. So when air is under less pressure, when it, it expands and it cools. On the other hand, when air descends in the atmosphere, it contracts it heats, and it heats up. Imagine all those molecules now in a smaller volume knocking up against each other faster and faster, creating a higher average kinetic energy of the molecules. So again, when air descends, it contracts and warms. Why does it contract? Well, it contracts because the pressure is higher around it, and those molecules actually push it inward, just like your water bottle seemingly sucking in when you come down to lower elevation. So when air descends, it contracts and warms. Hmm. Have you ever pumped up a basketball or a volleyball and then felt the needle when you took it out of the ball? It's hot. Part of the reason it's hot is that you've pumped air from the low pressure environment into the high pressure ball. And when air is under, gets put from low pressure to a higher pressure, it contracts and warms. All right, our last topic, latent heat. Latent heat is energy that is stored or released when a substance changes state. When it goes from a gas to a liquid, a liquid to a solid, a solid to a liquid, or a liquid to a gas, etc. For example, let's consider evaporation, when a liquid is being converted to a gas. When water evaporates, when it goes from a liquid to a gas, essentially what's happening is that the hydrogen bonds that hold the water molecules together are being broken and the individual water molecules are free to leave the liquid. It takes energy to break those bonds. It takes energy to take that liquid water and have it turn into a gas. And essentially, that energy is absorbed into that system and the remaining water is actually cooled during this process. So evaporation is actually a cooling process. Your body actually takes advantage of this. Think about when you sweat. Sweating is just evaporation. Your body uses evaporation to cool you. When you get too hot, you sweat and your body is cooled. So evaporation is a cooling process. You need to remember that mantra for the rest of the course. Evaporation is a cooling process. Basically, latent energy is stored, latent heat is stored, and the remaining liquid is cooled. Condensation is the reverse of evaporation. It's when a gas goes to a liquid. Thus, not surprisingly, condensation is a warming process. That heat energy that was, that was absorbed into the system during evaporation is basically released during condensation. So when water condenses on a surface, the water actually warms. All right, again, adiabatic cooling and heating and latent heat are very minor topics in Chapter 4. I just chose to introduce them here so that you'll have a small bit of background when we address these topics again in Chapter 6.